Thanks, thanks, Sean. That's overly generous. A line I've been using since I left government when I come out to a place like Syracuse outside the D.C. area and, and get that kind of gushing kind of introduction. My response is clearly not given under oath. All right? <laughs> so thanks, yeah, thanks for the chance to come and chat. Uh, for those of you who uh, signed up for the uh, Russian expert here to come and give you a coherent view of both Russia and American policy towards Russia, that's next week. All right. <laughs> I'm not that guy. I, I'm a career intelligence officer, and I'm, I'm here to share with you uh, some thoughts from my perspective about Russia, the Russian Federation, Russian policy, and, and frankly, American relations with the Russian Federation. It, it, it won't quite be stream of consciousness, all right, but you're not going to be able to kind of take notes and walk away with the coherent there. I wish I'd have recognized that all along. That's how it works with regard to to what's going on in Russia, all right? But I do think I can share with you some interesting aspects, not because I have any great scholarship on my part, but just because I was there sometimes, and I could see some things evolve, all right? So, so let, let's, let's begin. Uh, let, let me talk a little bit about focus on Russia, or, or, or more accurately, kind of in the terms of a confessional here, uh, losing a bit of focus on Russia. I was director of CIA for 31 months, which modestly above average for tenure there. In those 31 months, I went to more than 50 countries. Not one of them was named Russia. It just didn't get to the top of the list. For good or bad, I'm just telling you, it just didn't get to the top of the list. I had a whole bunch more people come visit me, right? more than 50, because it's good to be a friend of the Central Intelligence Agency if you're a foreign intelligence service. One of those visitors was the Russian resident, okay, the chief Russian announced intelligence officer at the Russian embassy in, in Washington. And we had a pleasant 15 to 20 minute chat over tea. I wished him well, thanked him for the visit, walked him to the door, and my electronic surveillance team immediately entered the office through the back door and did an electronic sweep of my office to make sure he had not left behind any listening devices. Are you getting a picture here? <laughs> okay. It's not a close relationship. Uh, as director of NSA, uh, we, we, were, we were in the, in the business of turning Russian linguists into Serbian linguists. If you recall the issues du jour uh, in the Balkans uh, at that point uh, in history. All right. So there was, there was this pulling back on the part of American intelligence with regard to what was primarily job one through job N for most of my professional career. I, I tell a story. If you recall, in August of 2008, uh, the Russian army invaded Georgia. Recall they grabbed Abkhazia and South Ossetia. I mean, the fine print, the tactical circumstance, it was probably the Georgians that were pulling the lanyards on the first pieces of artillery that provoke the fight, and then, and then the Russians, why you would provoke a fight with a near core level Russian army exercise ending just over your border is beyond my ability to understand. But so it appears the Georgians did. Uh, the Russian army comes across the border on the grounds of protecting uh, Russian speakers in, in those two provinces and so on, at which point Misha Saakashvili, the, the president of Georgia, and a good friend of America, right, actually a graduate of many American uh, academic institutions. President Saakashvili calls Steve Hadley, uh, the national security advisor, in essence saying, the Russians are coming, and I think they're coming to Tbilisi. And so what Saakashvili wants to know from Steve is, are they coming to Tbilisi? And Steve said something to the effect, I'll call you back, <laughs> okay? And he immediately picked up the phone and called me. I was just on the phone with President Saakashvili. Uh, are, are, where, are the Rus where are the Russians? How far are they going? Are they going to Tbilisi? And I gave a classic intelligence officer's answer. I'll call you back. <laughs> so I went out in my outer office. It's August 2008. Went out of my outer office, turned to my two executive assistants, Mary and Mary Jane, and said, Get my Georgia people up here right away. 
people who would be familiar with the circumstance. They started going through both their physical Rolodex and their electronic Rolodex, and they're hitting buttons and getting on the phone. And I turned over here to my chief of staff, Larry Pfeiffer, and looked at Larry and said, we got Georgia people, don't we? <laughs> and we did, and they were good. In fact, they were great. In fact, they briefed the president who came out a day or two later to get a full laydown. But the point I'm trying to tell you is we were, we were so focused on the things we were doing, okay, the Georgia, the Russian army, they weren't in the center of the scope. So remember, I still got this question. Where's Russian armor? How far are they going? Are they going to Tbilisi now? I think those of you who studied this know they don't. They go to Shkinvali, they hang a right, and they go, they go from South Ossetia up to Abkhazia and establish a zone of control in, in northern Georgia. But we don't know that at the time. You know, how, how punishing is the Russian punishment exercise uh, going to be? And so we turn to national technical means. You know, who should be able to routinely, if not intercept and decrypt Russian army communications, should at least be able to tell us where the hell they're coming from. It, it, it's called DF. It's direction finding. And so we put a, we put a request in to DF the flot. I'll decode that. Okay? Use direction finding equipment to identify the flot, the forward line of troops. Where is Russian armor. We had so focused America's precious intelligence dollars in order to be able to pick up phone calls from low-powered cell phones in the Khorramshah Valley of Afghanistan that we had actually lost the ability to do what was fundamentally a simple task, not decode, decrypt, and read the communications, but simply know where the radio was when it was emitting the signal. We could not electronically remotely, technically, locate the flot. And so I actually, as director of, of CIA, directed several of my uh, in, installations, stations, in the Caucasus, get in your car, drive to Tbilisi, <laughs> go into the station, get a, get a phone and a GPS, drive north. When you see a T-80, stop. <laughs> take a reading and phone the coordinates in. And that's actually pretty much what happened. Okay, so, so I'm trying to give you the impression that we, you know, we, we, we moved focus away from, from the Russian issue. Now, you know, um, uh, you can go ahead and accuse us of one thing or another, but, you know, institutions are like, like human beings and stressed human beings who've got a lot of things to do in a day. And so you can't do everything you want to do with regard to your studies. So too with intelligence agencies, can't do everything that they might want to do had they have enough resources. When I was director and someone asked me, what are your priorities? I, I would bark out a little bit of Washington alphabet soup. It was CTCPROW, counterterrorism, counterproliferation, the rest of the world. All right, and, and that's pretty much how we, we allocated the resources you gave us. Dave Petraeus, familiar name, Army guy, yeah. Uh, one of my successors, Dave came to the house uh, to visit me uh, as he was preparing for his confirmation hearings to be director of, of CIA. And Dave was talking to all the former living directors and asking the kinds of questions you'd expect a guy to ask. What's it like? I'm a, I'm a military guy. What's it like with civilians? And we got all done over coffee and coffee cake in, in the kitchen of my house. He was there with his wife, Holly. We're walking out. I let my wife, Janine, and Holly kind of lead, go out on the porch, and I do that kind of Washington poolside. Hey, Dave, one more thing. And pulled him into my living room and said, Dave, uh, you need to know something. CIA has never looked more like OSS than it does right now. Office of Strategic Services, Direct Action Arm, World War II. Dave, CIA has never looked more like OSS than it does right now. And by the way, that's good. America is safer for it. But you realize, right, it's not OSS. It's the nation's global espionage service. And you're going to have to struggle every day like I did and I think Leon's doing to widen your aperture and remind not just yourself but your agency that it's got these broader responsibilities and cannot be overly consumed 
uh, the immediate operational tactical requirements of the terrorism fight. Um, if Intel had a little problem with focusing, I think policy had, uh, had equal challenges. Um, recall President Bush's famous quote, he went to visit Vladimir Putin, he looked into his eyes and saw his soul. Recall that? Yeah, but I think it was Bob Gates who, who went there, uh, went, went there uh, later and said, uh, well, the first thing he said was when he got to Moscow, <laughs> it's, it probably doesn't rank high in good things to say to your hosts, right? He gets out of the plane, goes to Moscow, go to downtown Moscow and says, ah, so this is what it looks like from the ground. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gates famously said, I looked Putin in the eye and I saw the KGB. <laughs> uh, and President Obama had his own kind of relationship thing going on with Vladimir Vladimirovich. Re re recall, he said he's like a, like a lazy schoolboy in the back row, and he always slouches and, and, and so on. So, I mean, it, it wasn't that it was just your intel guys who might not have been spending much as, as, as much energy as you wanted focusing on this because they, like we, had a bunch of stuff over here that was pretty much filling up going up the day. Uh, I think President Obama's analysis, though, once this became something you can't avoid, uh, I think President Obama's analysis was generally about correct. Um, these are my words now, not the president's, but I think they reflect what he said. Um, this is not a resurgent power. This is a revanchist power, but it is not resurgent. You, you don't confuse these guys with China. Right? And, and, and again, still my words, but I think reflecting President Obama's thinking. Uh, the things you need to be somebody in the modern era, fundamentally the Russian Federation doesn't have. Now, they got nuclear weapons, but that's, that's the detritus of a previous era. Okay? They got a veto at New York, but that truly is the detritus of an earlier era. When you think about what you got now, the things you need to be somebody, They've certainly just about run out of democracy. They've pretty much run out of entrepreneurship. I ask, it's a rhetorical question, but I'll ask the question. When was the last time you bought anything from Russia that wasn't energy, fish eggs, or a Matryoshka doll? Okay, and not, not many people have an answer for that question. Okay, it, it is not an entrepreneurial society. They're not running out of oil or gas, but they're never getting more than 50 bucks a barrel for it. Because if, it, if they do, we're going to get in the car and drive southwest of here to Erie and start on cranking the, the pipes on top of Marcellus Shale, and we're going to drive the global price of oil back down. Now, the numbers may not be correct, but you understand that they're not going back to 110, which is where they were for what I will call Putin 1. All right? that, remember, there's, a, there's an interval there where Medvedev gets to be, gets to be president. So, you know... Oil at a fixed price, not a good price for the, for the Federation. Running out of entrepreneurship, uh, running out of democracy, uh, running out of Russians. Uh, a declining population, not just because of the birth rate, but frankly because of the death rate. Life expectancy in the Federation is less than that in the, in the old Soviet Union. That's a statement. And the primary causes of death for Russian males Traffic accidents, violence, and substance abuse. Right? And, so, and, and oh, by the way, this is not a society that can make up for the domestic shortfall by the way they embrace immigrant cultures and civilizations. Right? That is just not part of, the, part of the playbook. And so there are very, very limiting factors here in, in what, um, what constitutes the ability to be great in, in, the, in the broader world. Um, remember, revanchist, not necessarily resurgent. Now, I, uh, Putin is playing what I view to be a very weak hand very, very aggressively, and more often than not, very, very well. I was on Morning Joe, it's probably two years ago now, he had done something we should have been mad at, and uh, we were complaining appropriately. I was in, in D.C., they were up in New York, and they're about ready to cut the commercial, and I go, hey, Joe, can, can I just say one more thing? Yeah, yeah, General, what do you got? And I said, Joe, you realize he's doing all this and he doesn't have more than a pair of sevens in his hand, right? No picture cards. And of course, he keeps betting those, those sevens, and he'll keep betting them until somebody calls. 
And up, up until that point, and maybe even up to the present time, um, nobody's calling. And so he's, again, playing this um, fairly weak hand very, very well. So what, what, what has he done? Well, he's grabbed Crimea. He's parked in the Donbass. He's beat his chest against the Baltic states. He has returned Russian slash Soviet military power to the Middle East uh, for the first time in 50 years. He is harassing American aircraft and ships in international spaces, air, air and sea. Uh, he, again, is acting very, very aggressively. Um, I think it has to do with his social contract. I think Putin won. OK, that's oil, 100 and change a barrel. Uh, Putin won is, I'm going to be autocratic. That shouldn't disturb you. You're used to it. Okay, And oh, by the way, you're going to be rich. And if you got the Medvedev inter interval, he comes back. Oil is where, it, where it's at. The sovereign wealth fund isn't, isn't growing nearly like it was growing. You've got the effect of Western sanctions. Okay? And I, now I think the, the, the bumper sticker for the social contract is, hey, I'm still going to be autocratic, but don't worry. You're going to be proud. And hence, you've got this redressing of historic Russian grievances. I've, had, I've heard Putin described as a nationalist. Yeah, that's a given. A Soviet nationalist. Not a, not a narrowly defined Russian nationalist in terms of what he views to be his legitimate space is the, the space that was formerly occupied uh, by, by the Soviet Union. And so he's been very, very active in, in, in those areas. Um, there's, another, there's another broad aspect of this, too, where I'm going to make you proud. Uh, it's fairly easy to, easy to be sympathetic to the Russian population with regard to the events of the late 20th and early 21st century. I mean, this, this, this for whatever issues it may have, whatever problems we know about, uh, whatever judgments we may make about their political system, they were still somebody. And they have gone through a generation and change that had to be uh, tremendously traumatic. And so now you've got, I think, President Putin trying to restore Russia's self-image as Russian greatness. There's a whole lot of talk about the Third Rome, and, and, and frankly, that's why you get that, that really starkly conservative social policy inside the Russian Federation uh, that, 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 again, kind of recredentials them as, as, as the heir, the genuine, the legitimate heir of the Western uh, cultural tradition. Now, they are not accepted as the Third Rome. By the, West of the, by the rest of the West, right? And they very much want to be accepted. And I'm going to go through now an extended metaphor that's going to look like a Saturday morning cartoon until I'm done, and then I hope it will make sense. So, so bear with the cartoon, all right? It's a little Scooby-Doo here right in the middle of a talk on, on the Russian Federation. I picture the Russians, because of those limitations I told you about before, all right, the, the population, the, the industry, the entrepreneurship, and so I mean, I, I had one analyst describe Russia to me as a, uh, a, a colonized country. Now, it's colonized by Russians uh, who exploit it for everything it's worth and go live in London. But it is, in that sense, a colonized country. So they're sitting over here, and unfortunately, the only chair they got is the one that lets them sit at the little people's table. All right. He's over here with the kids. Now he can, he can look over here and he can see the big people. And they're sitting, sitting here at this fine, tall, large table. All right? The big people, you know, the European Union, the United Kingdom, the United States. The people who are somebody. And he desperately wants to pull his chair from that little table over to this big table. But I already told you, his chair doesn't fit. So what he's doing every night is walking over there during the hours of darkness, and secretly with a saw, hacking off about half to three quarters of an inch from the big people's tables and the big people's chairs every night. So that sooner or later, after he's done that enough nights, he's going to grab his chair, and he's going to slide it over, and it's going to look like it fits perfectly. It's going to look like he just belongs. 
which again is my Scooby-Doo Saturday morning cartoonish representation of support for Brexit, for the attack on the European Union, for the struggle to destroy NATO unity, for trying to delegitimize practically every election in the Western democracies of Western Europe, and for their unsustained, unrelenting attack on American democracy in 2015 and 2016. He wants to de delegitimize institutions and countries with whom he cannot compete in their current state. And his objective here, knowing that I can't go this way, is I got to make them go that way. Which now brings me to Russian interference in the American electoral process. Okay? Now, I began with a bit of a confessional here about, you know, we were looking over here and all this other stuff started to pop up over here. Go figure. Let me do another round of confessing. Um, I actually have some experience with regard to the American cyber enterprise. Okay, I was the director of the National Security Agency. I was not commander of Cyber Command. It did not exist when I was at Fort Meade. But what did exist was the embryonic ancestor of Cyber Command, something clumsily described as Joint Functional Component Command Net Warfare, which fundamentally meant that in addition to stealing other people's information, if I had the appropriate authority, I could destroy their information too. In other words, I had both, for those of you who study this kind of stuff, I had both Title 50 and Title 10 authorities. I had traditional espionage authorities. I had traditional war-making authorities. So, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm just credentialing myself here, okay? I, I, I know a little bit about this cyber thing, all right? I got first parachuted into the cyber thing in the mid-1990s. I got assigned to the, what was then called the Air Intelligence Agency uh, in uh, San Antonio, Texas. I just left being the head of American intelligence for U.S. forces in Europe, which meant in the mid-90s, I'm dealing with the war in the Balkans, which was genuinely medieval in its causes, its effects, and its conduct. And then I get parachuted into San Antonio, where I take over the Air Intelligence Agency, which was at the time on the cutting edge of American thinking about this new cyber thing. Frankly, during one of my first briefings, they never quite said this to me, but if I summarized it, it was, Hayden, huh, glad you're here, General. Please sit down, take out a clean sheet of paper and a number two pencil. Write this down. Land, sea, air, space, cyber. It's a domain, it's a location, it's a place. We're going to go fight there. Got it? Land, sea, air, space, cyber. Right? By the way, that's now American military doctrine. It's enshrined in American doctrinal manuals. That's how we think about it. What is not as public, was when we were in San Antonio, we actually had a pretty severe argument internally as to what it is we were about. Okay. What is this new thing? And, 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 and very briefly, the, the parameters of, of, of the debate were, are, are, we, are we in the cyber business? Is this about cyber dominance? Or is this about information dominance? Okay, now that may not be a clear distinction right, right at the moment. Let me, let me work it out, all right? Cyber dominance or information? Now, when we argued, we argued this like we were Jesuits at a medieval university, okay? Because, I mean, this is a fundamental doctrinal choice. Which way are you going? Now, as you probably know, since we don't have an information dominance command, <laughs> hint, hint, okay? We went cyber. The alternative was not just cyber, you know, the digital network thing, but fighting for, winning in, dominating the information domain, which meant it included cyber, but it also included psychological operations or what's called MISO now, military some information support operations. Sounds like a soup, I know it, but okay. <laughs> it's still psychological operations, disinformation, deception, public diplomacy, public affairs, shaping the information environment was what was behind door two. We opted for door one, cyber. Frankly, because door two, probably already gotten the impression, that's very complicated. Cyber is tough enough. This is really hard. And frankly, it's really hard in a free society to be you know, torquing and untorquing information which you cannot guarantee is only going to 
going to get to the other guy. In a, in a connected world, it blows back on us. So we found it operationally easier to go, hey, we're cyber guys. And easier to go, we're cyber guys, because this implicated so many serious things. I'm sorry, did, did, is that distinction clear enough? Yeah. The Russians took door two. Okay. Unarguably, clearly, doctrinally, the Russians went to door two. And if, if you're really interested in this, go ahead, Google a general named Garasimov, who is now chief of the general staff. And as a younger officer, he wrote about information dominance, working in the information domain, creating the information space within which conflict takes place, information space as a decisive arm of the conflict. And hence, Hence, you get little green men going into Crimea, where everyone's going, I wonder what those little green men mean. Okay. That's, why, that's why Russian separatists in the Donbass shoot down a Malaysian airliner and kill 300 innocent people in, in an act that is so blatant we, we should be done talking about it. And the Russian information machine creates such a cloud. I'm seeing some folks nod, so you're familiar with this. They create such a cloud over the <clears throat> facts of the case that actually a lot of normal Europeans say, oh, that's just very complicated. It's really hard to figure out what happened there. It is a byproduct of the Russians going for door number two, not door number one. We saw door number two in the American electoral campaign in 2016. It began with simple cyber theft. It began with agents of the Russian Federation stealing a bunch of American emails. Emails of the Democrat National Committee, emails of John Podesta. Now, I, 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 you know, you, you look like friendly people, so I'm just going to be totally honest with you here, all right? That's called honorable international espionage, okay? And if we could do it as Americans, I mean, if we could steal the emails of United Russia, and we actually thought those emails would teach us something we didn't know, we'd steal them in a heartbeat. The enabler for this, the theft of the emails, is not a very interesting part of this story. The theft of the emails is accepted international practice. It's what adult nations, it's an R-rated thing out there. It's what adult nations do to one another, right? Steal for knowledge. Now, there, there are interesting subplots to the, to the Russian theft. I, I'm almost certain the Russian government didn't do it. It was done by Russian criminal gangs on behalf of the Russian Federation. I, I was giving a talk in downtown Washington for Yevgeny Kaspersky, uh, Kaspersky Labs, antivirus, really good products. Don't buy them if you're buying them for a .gov product because they've been decertified by our government, all right? But they are very high quality products, and I, I know Yevgeny. We've been on a couple of panels in Europe together. And we, we've chatted. So he invites me to come and give a talk for, for Kaspersky North America at the Reagan Center down in D.C. Okay. okay. So I go down there and I, I do my normal cyber thing, right? And, and one of the historical examples of the cyber thing is the, the Russians collapsing the internet system in Estonia in 2007. All right? If, if, if you recall the history, the Estonians, now independent, right, um, want to take a Red Army memorial that's in downtown Tallinn, and they want to move it out to the suburbs where there's a Red Army graveyard. Of course, the Russians, not a good idea. Uh, a lot of Russian angst about this. And in my story, I then, kind of using air quotes at, at the Reagan Center, and then said, patriotic Russian hackers then attacked the Estonian internet system and brought it to its knees with a massive DDoS attack. And again, for those of you who study this, uh, you know that there is no country on earth more wired than Estonia. Okay? I mean, they do everything, including the actual vote, with their thumbs. Okay? So they collapse the Estonian internet system, patriotic Russian hackers. So I got all done with the speech, I'm walking off stage, and Yevgeny's at the bottom of the stage. At the bottom of the stairs saying, Michael, very interesting, good speech, very, really liked it. Those weren't patriotic Russian hackers. All right, who were they? And he begins to explain to me. Now, I'm going to use my words now, not Yevgeny Kaspersky's. Okay? Uh, Godfather one, scene one. Okay? Uh, wedding on the lawn. Don Corleone's in the library. Taking petitions, remember? 
The undertaker comes, my daughter, she's under, under threat. Don Corleone, I, I need a favor. Yes, yes, I will grant you this favor. I will protect your daughter. But from time to time, and this time may never come, but from time to time, I may call upon you for a service. Remember? Yeah. Don, Don Vladimir has that relationship with Russian criminal gangs, okay, which allows the Russian criminal gangs pretty much a, a free legal space to do their thing as long as their thing is that way, not this way. And then from time to time, the Don has need of a service. Criminal gangs do the relatively elementary cyber heist, pull the data in. So, so far, the only thing unusual about this is kind of outsourcing it. In terms of nation states trying to steal political data from other nation states, happens all the time. And now we get into what's really happening. Remember door two, not cyber, information dominance. The Russians then weaponize the information and begin to push it back in to the inf American information space via WikiLeaks, through a website they've created on their own called DC Leaks, by pushing the data into our space and then having an army of trolls, very likely in St. Petersburg, touch the data in ways that prompt the Google algorithms to pull the data forward as trending, not human beings doing this, but, but bots, pulling the data forward as trending, and now it becomes part of the American information space, which is then reflected in RT and Sputnik News about what is going on in America, which is then reflected in the American Twitter sphere and Facebook pages. Door two, information dominance. Everything I just told you is a high confidence judgment of the American intelligence community, and although we occasionally get things wrong in the past, after the Iraq weapons of mass destruction fiasco, we don't slap high confidence on anything unless we are really, really certain. And I would tell you that what I've told you now is high confidence, not because somebody did some forensics at some DNC website. It's because we're on the other side of the screen and, and have a pretty good idea as to what happened. So why did the Russians do this? The, um, the uh, intelligence assessment, it's called an ICA, Intelligence Community Assessment, uh, run, it is done by the DNI, FBI, CIA, and NSA. And you all understand that alphabet soup? Okay, good. Um, the intelligence community assessment is, number one, the Russians did it to mess with your heads. Check. That happened. I mean, when you, when you get the president-elect of the United States in a really ugly contest with his intelligence services, check. They messed with your heads. They did it to mess with our heads. They did it to punish Hillary Clinton because, frankly, Putin hates her. Okay? Third reason they did it was because they wanted to delegitimize what they was, were confident was going to be a Clinton administration. They wanted to undercut her validity, her popularity with the American people. And then about September or October, um, they kind of woke up and said, damn, that other guy could win. And then there, the, the, the high confidence judgment of the community is that they then began to do things to actually push the vote in the direction of Donald Trump. Okay? All that's high confidence judgment of the American intelligence community. I believe it in my heart of hearts. I also believe it affected the election. I cannot measure the effect. No one can measure the effect. So now we're done talking about the effect. Donald Trump is the legitimate president of the United States. But the big story here is that the Russians, as part of that broad campaign to make this table smaller so their chair fits, it's part of, the part of it, I mean, they've done the same thing in other Western democracies. As part of that campaign, they did something unprecedented to the American public, to the American information space, and to the American uh, electoral process. American intelligence kind of got wind of this April-ish of 2016. I mean, the Russians do stuff like this a lot. But about April-ish or so, maybe May, maybe, you know, this is looking a little different here. This is looking a little more substantial. It looks a little more broad. It looks like it's a little more approved at a very, very high level. And so in the summer, the leaders of your intelligence community began to try to, metaphorically, of course, shape the president of the United States by the lapels, saying, you got to worry about this. You got to worry about this. And the historical record's pretty clear. Even if the president accepted it, 
the choices of what you do about this are fairly limited because if you do too much, it looks like you're putting your thumb on the scale and you're trying to affect the electoral process yourself. So the president allows, the president allows John Brennan, who was head of CIA at the time, to do what John described to me as a high, hard brushback pitch to his counterpart, a fellow named Bortnikov, who was head of the FSB, kind of knocked this off. President Obama raised it on the margins of the G20 with Putin. Okay? And then, with data in hand, which they pretty much had for a while, but now with the approval of the president, on the 6th of October, Jim Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, and Jay Johnson, the Secretary of Homeland Security, hold a really important news conference and give about two-thirds of what it was I've told you already. Okay, they, they don't get into the motivation part, but the Russian manipulation, the information space, the, the bots, the touching the data, that's, that's out there. And it is an absolute blockbuster story when it comes out for 29 minutes. And then the Access Hollywood video was released. President Trump, the bus, bad language. 30 minutes after that, WikiLeaks dumps the John Podesta emails. What an amazing coincidence to report. And, and the Russian intervention story then pretty much gets buried pre-election day. I'm going to fast forward. Uh, in, in early January, they then go brief the president-elect pretty much with the whole story as I've laid it out to you. Okay? Uh, the president-elect then issues a statement on the afternoon of 6 January saying our wonderful intelligence folks is, have come to, uh, to brief us. Uh, they, they've laid out a really, really, really serious cyber problem. They, remember door one, door two. Um, they laid out a really, really serious cyber problem, mentioned that the Russians had done certain things, but assured us that the Russians had had no effect on the election. Okay. Uh, everything after we have really great intelligence officers is a lie. But that was the public statement from the Trump campaign as they tried to pivot away from the real story, which was, you got a Russia problem. Remember back to losing focus and maybe we got too much over here. Um, the um, Trump campaign vis-a-vis -vis the Russians is, is, is just a mystery. I mean, you, you follow this. I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, so I won't dwell on it. But, but, but the, pre the candidates inability to criticize Vladimir Putin no matter what issues were brought up to him. It's just, just stunning. Um, I wrote an article for the Washington Post the Friday before the election um, in which I tried to, I tried to parse out the, 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 the almost inexplicable relationship between campaign Trump and the Russian Federation. I, I go with, he, he, no matter what he says, he won't say anything negative about Putin. I go back to, 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 to really puzzling connections between members of the Trump campaign and, and the Russians. Uh, you got Roger Stone, people going back and forth. Uh, you've got Don Jr. talking about, we got a lot of Russian money, but uh, you don't know where it all, I mean, it, it was just eerie. I, um, I got to the end of the article, and this is a Friday before the election, right in the center of the op-ed page of the Washington Post. And I got to the end of the article, and I mean, I, I had to connect the dots. I mean, you know, I just, just can't throw chum out there and say, well, I wish I knew what was going on. <laughs> um, and I said, look, uh, I, I'm, really, I'm really challenged to explain this. And so, so I, I, I reverted to a phrase from the Soviet people, uh, Soviet era. Um, the, um, the Soviets used to make use of what we in the West would call fellow travelers, all right? Uh, fairly naive individuals that, frankly, the Soviets probably had a fair amount of contempt for, but we were quite happy to manipulate them and, and use them for their own purposes. Uh, the, the Russian phrase for that person is Pelezny Durak, okay. useful idiot. And I ended the article with, maybe we got a Pelezny Durak situation here. And, then I, and I, to, to be fair, I said, look, this is probably going to offend an awful lot of people who, who support Mr. Trump, and I understand that. But, but frankly, that's the most benign interpretation I can come up with right now. 
and I, and I, just, I just left it there. So here we are, all right, with, with our relations with the Russian Federation as, as, as bad as you can possibly imagine. With President Trump, no matter what his instincts may be, I, you know, he's never, he has never made a speech saying our relationship with the Russian Federation will be governed by the following three principles. I mean, I, you just don't know. But he certainly has no political maneuvering room in which to warm our relations with the Russian Federation. And we here in the United States are trying to search for truth. Because if we don't want it to happen again, we should have a pretty good idea of what happened then. Um, I don't know that the intelligence community is seized of the issue. They've done their duty. They've issued their report. And frankly, the intelligence community responds to the priorities of the, bada bada bing, the president. And as recently as two weeks ago, the, the president said that the Russian story was a hoax. So I don't think the intel guys are rowing very hard. They're doing their duty, but I don't think that's the center of gravity. You've got investigations in Congress, but again, that's Congress. And with all the political and procedural baggage that comes with that. And, and then you've got the, the real dog with the bone between his jaws investigation with Bob Mueller at the FBI. But that's all about breaking laws, which is important, but is frankly not the question I'm asking. The question I'm asking is, what's the full story about, about what happened? And so that's kind of where we are in, in, in the broader scope of things, it's still trying to divine exactly what happened, and, and most importantly, taking steps not to do it, not to allow it to happen again. I'm going to end with one editorial comment, Sean, and then we can, we can have at it with a generalized scrum. Um, what it was I described the Russians doing is called a covert influence campaign. And I would be the last person in this room as a former director of such and such to claim that our government has never, ever attempted to conduct a covert influence campaign. Okay? But I can tell you, as someone who should know a little bit more about this than the average citizen, that you, covert influence campaigns never create fractures in a society. You can't do it. All covert influence campaigns can do is to exploit pre-existing fractures in a society. And so if you're asking for my general counsel as how do we best inoculate ourselves against this kind of thing happening in the future, the answer is pretty easy change how we behave towards one another in our political discourse. And with that, I will stop and happily entertain any questions you might have. Thank you. That's a, that's a, you hear the question? You know, what, what, what's the successor to Putin if, if you have a sudden change, a health reason or accident or whatever? Um, the, the genuine answer is I don't know. All right? And I've, I've been party to conversations about this. And, and, and generally what I get is because of the current political culture in the Russian Federation, you get Putin without Putin. You, you, the, the system is designed to, to work the way it currently works. And even if you change personalities, I mean, you get turbulence, you, 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 you probably have a period before you get back to stability. But the, but the system, just because of where Russia is currently in its history, the system will default in the direction of, of what, it is, what it is you have now. Yes, sir. So, sort of not to overcome, I know that the topic's more about Russia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sort of recognizing the influence of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Mm -hmm. um, do you see China and Russia becoming, you know, closer allies yeah. or closer competitors sure. in the future? I guess. Yeah. So it's China, Russia. How's that going to work? So I, I gave you a fairly idealistic view here. I was condemning Russia for interfering in what is a genuine democracy and so on. Now I'm going to give you a real politic answer. All right. I love One Belt, One Road. 
right? And push, push that Chinese influence along that Marco Polo route as much as you can. Keep it out of the South China Sea. Okay? Make, it, make it competitive with Russia as opposed to competitive with America, the Pacific power. Okay? And, 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 and I guess a corollary is I, I, don't, I don't see these two kind of lining up. I, I think there could be a mutual energy dependency. So as we begin to liquefy Marcellus natural gas and begin to ship it to Europe and wean our European friends off of Russian gas, the Russians are probably going to have to turn to the Chinese for a market. I get that part. But I, I don't see the geopolitical convergence. Somebody in the back. No, oh, somebody in the front. Uh, so building, yep. uh, building up on your analogy that Russia is playing a very weak hand very aggressively, what do you think of allegations of potential Russian support to the Taliban in Afghanistan in order to make Taliban a second Vietnam? Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, his question, the Russian support for the Taliban. The, 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 the Russians are playing a, a hand obviously from an American point of view, is not very constructive, all right? But actually, from a strategic point of view, they're not trying to be constructive. They are trying to be obstructionist. And, and, they, and that is a high leverage point. Number one, you got the veto in New York. I already told you, that's kind of an accident of history. But they got the veto, all right? So that, that gives them, uh, I don't want to say artificial sense of power, but in a sense it is. It doesn't devolve out of the current realities of power. But they've got that, all right? They go to Syria, all right, where, where, frankly, a minimal amount of military effort, okay, largely made possible because we didn't, all right, really changes the physics of the battlefield and, and actually, actually, actually reverses the flow of the river. You know, Basha was going down. And then the Russians come in. Again, fairly minimal commitment. Turns it this way. And so what you've got are the Russians in a... In a, in, a, in a position where global circumstances offer them the opportunity to obstruct, which doesn't require a great deal, but does, does then give them higher leverage than you would think they would deserve. I mean, look, the economy of Italy is bigger than that of Russia, all right? So you, you kind of get a sense of why I'm judging it this way. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, General. Um, for the reasons you listed, isn't what you're talking about really the short-term view? Russia's a declining power. And look into the future, um, what, what, do you, what do you see them going forward? And if I could get one quick bonus question. The Europeans, other than Brexit, are, are showing us up. Uh, they're not as vulnerable to fake news. Yeah. Uh, there was an article about Italy the other day. Hey, so uh, hey, could, France, you, for example. Right, could you comment on why they're inoculated and we're not? Yeah. Um, so what was the first one? Uh, Long-term. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, you know, again, frankly, people think intel officers are supposed to be there to tell the future. We're not. We're, we're supposed to, to, try to try to create understanding of the present. And, and, and that's not a dodge. I'm going to go ahead and try to do the future here. But, but fundamentally, that, you know, if, that, if that's what you're asking of us, yours is as good as mine. You know, what's Yogi Bear predicting really hard, particularly about the future, okay? Uh, um, so, no, no, the, the, so that I... Um, I do think Putin knows that the, the timelines are against him, which I think is why he is aggressive, as aggressive as he has been in the short term, which frankly makes him more rather than less dangerous, because I think he understands the, the, the long-term trend lines. Now, based on Gerasimov, and I do recommend your, your reading him, I mean, he has got a pretty powerful asymmetrical hand, just playing to your second question, uh, which frankly, we can't turn against him. It's a different kind of society. And, and so he is now playing this asymmetrical information dominance hand uh, in a way that, frankly, is fairly threatening to our well-being, but it's a cheap hand. It's, it's, it's the one that the weaker power can use against the freer nation or the freer society. Um, I, I think that the, you know, I got Brexit, put that aside, all right? I think the Continentals have gone to school on Brexit and the American election. I am, I am totally confident that we have been full kimono here with, with the Europeans on what it is we think happened. All right, so that's, that's a plus. Um, I, I also think we're, we Americans are in a particular historical circumstance with our own political campaigns that is not the same in, in, in European countries. Okay? Um, and finally, the, the Europe, Europe, European constitutional systems allow a little more government tweaking of what is or is not news. 
we, we, we have a really powerful allergy against. So it, different circumstances, they went to school on us and uh, some more constitutional authorities than we're, custom, we're comfortable giving our government, I think gives the Europeans a little bit of an edge. I appreciate the full answer. Okay, thank you. Who's got a mic? Uh, thank you, General. Yeah. Well, Vladimir Putin, he made a statement that America was applying double standard on the issue of Crimea, Kosovo, and Catalonia. Do you think that is necessarily true? Or if you do not think so, do you, can you offer any reasons that if it's not true? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, the, the, the charge of... This, this is <laughs> actually... Did you all hear the question? Catalonia, Kosovo, Crimea, what's your problem? Um, <clears throat> This, this is a called the what about ism argument. When you, when you look at this very certain thing, and the, the counter is not to argue about that thing, it's to say, but yeah, but what about? You know, kind of like squirrel, squirrel, okay, and, 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 and go over there. Uh, I don't know much about Catalonia, I'm gonna leave that alone, okay? But I do know the Kosovars did not want to be part of the Serbian Federation, okay? Um, and and, and, and there, there is, there's a bit of a history there that kept Kosovo as an autonomous region. Um, you can make the vote that the Crimeans did not want to be part of, of you, you can make that choice. And, and frankly, I think if you had a free and open plebiscite, I think, um, I, I think that the returns would not have been as dramatic, but I think a lot of Crimeans would have voted to be part of the Russian Federation. Right? Uh, the Crimea is, um, I mean, it, it historically is Russian. It's the birthplace of Russian orthodoxy. All right, um, it's a home port for the Russian Black Sea Fleet. Uh, the Russians in Crimea are, by and large, military retirees. Okay, it's kind of like Tampa. Uh, for, 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 so I, I think it would go. But the Russians gave the Ukrainians absolute territorial guarantees in return for the delivery of Russian nuclear weapons back to Russia and out of Ukraine uh, in the uh, in the early 90s, okay, and so if the if the Russians are talking about the will of the people, all right, I'm going to say, okay, big guy, let's sign up, but before you get to do the vote in Crimea, let's do Ingushetia, all right, let's let's do Dagestan, okay. I mean, I could I could go off all sorts of autonomous republics inside the Russian Federation. So I, I think I think the issue was the changing of the border by force. Okay, that that actually. Moves it, moves this one into a column different uh, than than the others. So, although the IC may not be very focused on the uh, Russian hacking right I, now, well, to, yeah. I, I don't know enough, but I don't, mm -hmm. I just don't think it's, it's up there as that. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, let me put it to you this way: if the election had gone the other way, I'm pretty sure where it would be on the list. Yeah. The media obviously is still very attentive yeah. to it. And given your closing remarks on political fracturing, um, do you think this is warranted or it's valuable um, for the media to still be focusing on this role? Yeah, I, I, I do, because I do think it's an unanswered question. All right? Now, we've we got a real issue here. All right? Um, the media needs to be the media, not the opposition. And we really have to be careful it doesn't think of itself as the resistance. And, and there, there, there is a bit of a sliding scale there, okay? The, the, the media has got to work really hard to be kind of just calm balls and strikes, all right? And now in this particular case, I think the weight of evidence is storylines that are less friendly to the administration than other storylines, all right? But, you know, you can make a case that some networks out there are just looking for storylines that are less friendly to the administration. But it doesn't delegitimize some storylines which should be less friendly. So I'm, I'm on the air a lot, all right? And I, apropos nothing, I was on last night on Don Lemon, and the, um, the issue du jour was the phone call, all right? And, and I, I began by, I mean, I purposely, fundamentally based upon what I think the background of your question is, I purposely began with, well, first of all, Don, for anybody out there who's never made this phone call, you're not entitled to an opinion, okay? I've made this phone call. This is a really hard phone call to make. Anybody who's made this phone call would never criticize anybody for how they made this phone call. Right? So that, was my, so I, that was my kind of, come on, give guy a break. He didn't have to do this. 
He didn't do it well, but he didn't have to do it. Right? Now, then, then I, I fairly criticized the president for what he did after the phone call, you know, dragging the Kelly family in, trying to discredit his predecessors quite inaccurately. And then, if I could use that word again, he lied about what he said or didn't say. Okay, okay that's all bad. But I really, I actually use the word empathy. I really have empathy for the president for trying to make the call. I, I, I just think that's the right way to approach these things. And I do fear, I do fear that, that the press, frankly because the president attacks them all the time, there, there's, a, there's a natural response on the part of the press to just start punching back. Right? They, they, gotta, they gotta pull a lot of punches. Otherwise, good people, right, the ones we count on to do the right thing in the center, not the wing nuts, okay? The people in the center. People are gonna delegitimize the press the way the president, frankly, has. And we can't live with a delegitimized press. They, they, should be, they should be tough but fair, not view themselves as the, the opposition, and never view themselves as the resistance. Who's got a mic? There, okay. Um, I understand that as an intelligence officer, you're not supposed to see the future. You're just supposed to tell us <laughs> what's happening right now. But do you believe that the Russians are doing everything that they're doing right now in an attempt to possibly create more buffer states in Eastern Europe to prevent the spread of NATO to the east? So I had this debate in London. Um, I actually skipped over it because I was going along with too many war stories. But I had this debate in London last spring. I wrote this down somewhere. Yeah, well, maybe I didn't. Um, it was Intelligence Squared, which is, um, it happens in New York now, but the, but the grandfather is, is the London stage version of it. And the, and the premise was, uh, it's time to bring Russia in from the cold, okay? Confrontation with Russia is no longer in our interest. And so I was debating when my partner was um, uh, Sikorsky, uh, Radek Sikorsky, the form, former Polish foreign minister and defense minister. Polish defense minister, probably figure out where he's on this issue, okay? <laughs> so we're, we're, we're good. On the other side was an academic from King's College. I've forgotten her name. That's why I wrote it down, like you can't find it. And Vladimir Posner, who has been an, a spokesman, sometimes an apologist, actually all the way back to the Soviet days. And we had, okay, full auditorium. I remember it's been 600 people there. All right, we're very fancy. It's on BBC, you can find it. It's, it's BBC has, you can you know, Google, bring Russia in from the cold, Posner, Sikorsky. You can pull it up. Uh, we went in there, and, and the, the, the rhythm for Intelligence Squared is everyone votes going in, okay? And the premise, premise was, it's time to bring Russia in from the cold, okay? And there were, I think there was 49% said yes, okay? About 26% said no, and then everyone else said, eh, I don't know. And I'll let you know after the debate, all right? And so we had, we had the debate. And one of the arguments, okay, one of the arguments that both Posner and the, the young professor from King's College had was that NATO had threatened Russia with NATO expansion eastward. And so you, you, you had Poland and the Czech Republic and Slovak, Romania, Bulgaria, the Balts, okay, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all joining NATO and the EU. And that, that, was, that was really stupid. What do you think the Russians are going to do? That's absolutely threatening. They're, you know they're going to act just like this. So now, number one, I think that's the wrong premise. But it almost doesn't matter during a debate, right? You've got to argue against it. And, and my argument against it was I reject that. And it just comes now directly to your question. I reject that. Uh, NATO, wasn't, NATO arms were not threatening the Russian Federation. In fact, I can build you a case that NATO disarmed during this period. And we went, we went from a, a, a time in which we had dozens of maneuver brigades available for combat towards the east to a point where we, we, had, we were in single digits of maneuver brigades. So there was no increasing physical threat. And in fact, the physical threat from NATO arms to the Russian Federation was dramatically decreasing. What was scaring the Russian Federation was NATO ideas and NATO ideals, and NATO democracy, and NATO market economies. And, and my view of that was tough, okay? Get over it. Okay? We do not have the right to exclude the Polish people from a, from a Europe Poland free. 
We do not have the right to exclude the Latvian people from a Europe whole and free because the Russians just don't like it. And so I, I've got a pretty, as you can probably tell, pretty strong view that, yeah, I understand that, but that, that shouldn't com compel or control our action. At the end of the debate, that must have worked because it ended up 49-49. <laughs> Who's got it? All in the back. Um, as a, I, I appreciate what the previous speaker brought up. But, um, as a proud Polish American and a student who's focusing on Eastern Europe, specifically Poland and Russia, because of what's happening right now, um, do you see Poland's relationship with the U.S. as a pivotal ally increasing and rising in the ranks? Uh, Poland's important to the United States? Yes. Yeah, that would be hard to do um, because all my experience with the Poles as an, an ally of the United States, they were off the chart, all right? Uh, they, they, they offered to do things for us we should have been embarrassed to ask them to do. And I'm kind of talking about my old stuff, all right? And so we had a, we had a very, very good relationship uh, with, with the Poles. We have a very, very good relationship with the Baltics, all right? In fact, in many ways, we have better relationship with the eastern half of NATO than we do with the traditional western half, <laughs> all right? largely because the eastern half looks to us for protection. All right? I mean, we, we have the virtue of being powerful, fairly benign, but definitely distant. And, and therefore, the, the new democracies in Eastern Europe kind of hug us pretty tight. We, we, we've got the right combination that they feel that, that we need. So I was heartened. I thought he was slow, but I was heartened by President Obama's uh, European Defense Initiative. And I, I was actually in the Baltics and near Poland summer before this when we were beginning to move, um, frankly, American and other NATO arms into a permanent position. I think we've got a battalion each in the three Baltic states and, and in Poland. And the American unit that had departed Poland and was going, driving up through the Baltics, I mean, it looked like the liberation of Paris. I mean, the, the, the civilians genuinely celebrating, you know, America, an American striker battalion driving up a Polish and then a Latvian highway, right? So there, there was great welcoming. That's why I was really troubled when the candidate was asked, well, would you defend Latvia? And he said, well, it depends on whether they've paid their bills which is, for somebody in my background, just about as bad an answer as you could possibly get. Now, he's kind of fixed that, all right? And, and frankly, we've leveraged that to get, to get some other folks, not the Latvians, they paid a lot, but to get some other folks to, to chip in a little bit more. Not to NATO, you don't do that. You, you, you build your own defense capability. Um, so that there's been a little benign effect. But I do think it's really important for our interest to, to make it absolutely certain that no one doubts the American commitment to Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, including those out there on the extreme edge you know, of the threat environment, which would be the Poles, the Latvians, the Lithuanians, and the Estonians. Okay. Well, as testimonial to the extraordinary crowd that he's able to uh, bring together here for the, for the afternoon, we also have two jurists here, federal <laughs> justices, who are here to keep us honest throughout the entire proceedings. The <laughs> uh, Judge uh, Scullin and Judge Mormon uh, have both uh, been kind enough to spend their afternoon with us as well. We're just really delighted that you could, would do so and pleased to keep, given the fact that they've kept us completely honest during the course of the proceedings, that's for sure. <laughs> and to the Dean of the Maxwell School, thank you, sir, for letting us host an extraordinary visitor here today. Mike, this is just a small, small token okay. of our appreciation thank you. for your exceptional right. time that you've been here. Please join me. Thank you. Thank you.